God has had some things he's been dealing with my heart about for some time. I've been around the church long enough that I remember a phrase and have used the phrase myself, the burden of the Lord. And tonight, this is what this is. This is my heart. This is a burden that God has laid on my heart for this hour. And I want to begin to say how much I appreciate Pastor Mike allowing this opportunity. When I first started doing this many years ago, I couldn't understand why pastors were so reluctant to let some up-and-coming whippersnapper get behind their pulpit. Man, I had a word from God. I, had, I was going to straighten the world out. But once God placed me in this place, and I've told people, you know, whenever I was pastoring, sometimes I feel responsible for the breath that people breathe. That's how weighty and how heavy this load can be. Everything that takes place in this church is on his shoulders. Every person that stands behind this desk, he's responsible for. Everything that takes place, he'll stand before God one day and give an account to the Lord. And that's an awesome responsibility. And when a pastor opens their pulpit and says, would you come and speak, I count that as a privilege and an honor. And I am overwhelmed that the Holy Ghost has just chosen to anoint me. Like the Apostle Paul, I am among the least of the least of these, my brethren. I don't presume to be anything or anyone. I wanted to do a lot of things with my life, and preaching wasn't at the top of the list. But somehow or another, the Holy Ghost just wouldn't let me go. Sometimes the Lord blesses in a way that I'm able to say things that people just want to consume like honey because it's so sweet. Sometimes the Lord gives me a word and it may be bitter like quinine but it's something we need. And church, I want to say that, I said that to say this tonight, it may be a mixture of the both. There may be some things that may be sweet. There may be some things that may sound a little, taste a little bitter. But know my heart, and if I didn't believe with every fiber of my being that this was thus saith the word of God, I wouldn't be here to share it with you. I know what buttons to push to make us shout. I know what buttons to push to make us dance. I know what buttons to push to make us leave this place feeling warm and fuzzy all over. And there's time and a season for that, but sometimes there's a time and a season that the Lord just needs to set us down and give us a talking to, and if we'll obey and we'll listen, we can still walk away with that warm, fuzzy feeling all over. I believe with all my heart the Lord wants to do something here tonight. I believe, and Pastor Mike can tell you this, those who have ever stood behind this desk with the anointing, many times you have a, a, a burden in your heart and in your mind of the direction the Lord wants to take the service and what he wants to do. And that being said, I believe with all of my heart the Holy Ghost wants to do something in this place tonight in your life if you will listen, not to me, but hear what the Spirit is saying to the church age today and let the Lord be the Lord in these altars in a few moments. John's Gospel, chapter 5. One verse of Scripture that I'll be looking at is verse 7. And just keep that there for a few moments because I'll be referring back and forth to that from time to time. But in John's Gospel, chapter 5, 
we find that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem at a feast. Sounds good, doesn't it? Because when we think of feast, what do we think of? Food. Celebration. Jubilee. Worship. Praise. I mean, it was kind of like it was kind of like along the line of what we do right now at Christmas time. There was joy. There was laughter. There was fun. There was excitement. Special dinners were prepared. Special desserts were prepared. There was something special going on down at the church house because this was a time of, uh, of festivity. This was one of the highest, holiest feasts that they had throughout the year. And whenever they had these feasts and these high, significantly high, holy days, I mean, it was a big thing in those days. How do you, how many like celebration? How many are excited about it at Christmas? I still get excited about Christmas. I love Christmas. And as we can imagine right now with all the festivities and of all the things that were going on in the forefront and all the excitement and all the laughter and all the joy, but in the background, in the shadows, at a place known as the Sheep Gate, of the temple where they brought the sheep in for sacrifice. There was a pool in that vicinity called Bethesda. This word Bethesda has dual meaning. One meaning is running water. The other meaning is house of mercy. But at the pool of Bethesda, there was something that took place there. Scripture bears out that there were a lot of hurting people there a lot of people that were hurting in different ways maybe in their arm or their leg or their back or, 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 or and when we think of hurting sometimes that's all we think of is the physical but my friend let me tell you there's a lot of pain out there that may not be physical pain but it's pain just as real as physical pain there is an emotional trauma that can take place in our life that can cripple us just as much as any physical pain. There is a spiritual pain that is out there that people have, can be and have been devastated in, in the spiritual realm and in their spiritual side of their life that has crippled them and marred them and scarred them for life. But here at the pool of Bethesda, there were folks that were lying and setting and gathered around the pool because at certain times an angel of the Lord would come down, the Bible said, and stir the water, trouble the waters, shake the waters. And as the waters would begin to boil, as they would begin to churn, whoever was the first ones into the pool were healed. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? Man, you're talking about shouting ground. That's, that, 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 that's a place that, that, that man, it just gets exciting because healing is taking place here. Life-changing healing is taking place. Transformation, deliverance, all manner of good is taking place at this place. Man, there's, there, there's, there's, there's music playing on the main street of Jerusalem and there's trumpets that are sounding and there's singers that are singing. And, and here at the pool of Bethesda, we have folks sitting around waiting for the angel to stir the water so they can be healed. And for whatever sickness, whatever disease, whatever pain that they're feeling, all of a sudden it's going to be gone and their life is going to be changed. It's exciting. But the, nestled in all of this is verse 7. And in verse 7, I want to draw your attention to four words that the Holy Ghost has hammered into my heart. Jesus had talked to this one particular man laying there, <coughs> had been 38 years that he had been in this condition, that's a long time. And for 38 years, he lay there and he couldn't get his healing. So near, 
I mean, right there on the edge, right there on the brink, right there on the border of what he needed, yet so far away. Why? Four words this man said, I have no man. When the waters were troubled, I'm not able to get into the waters by myself. When the waters are stirred, when the angel touches the waters, I need help. I need assistance. I need someone to help me. I have no man. You know what that says to me? No one cares. One of the most heartbreaking words and thoughts, no one cares enough to help me. No one cares enough about my situation. They don't care enough about my life to be here to help me in my time of need. I want to tell you something, church. This breaks my heart because the Lord has spoken this to my spirit that there are a lot of people today in the church as well as outside the church that are saying the same thing. I have no one. I have no man. I have no one that cares. No one wants to be bothered with me. No one wants to be troubled with me. I have no one. I was reminded of Luke chapter 10, the Good Samaritan, where there was a man, the Bible said, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. And while he was there, they, the thieves beat him and they robbed him and they stripped him of his raiment and they threw him in the ditch and left him for dead. This man and this, this, this account is very much similar to the same man and the same thing at, Bethany, at Bethesda. Hurt, pain, devastation. <clears throat> Can I tell you that's exactly what the devil has done to a lot of folk today? Can I tell you that the devil has stolen from them not just their health, I was, my wife and I was talking this morning on the way home from church and in our Sunday school class, we had a great class this morning and we had a full class this morning and we took prayer requests and, and without fail, almost every person in our Sunday school class this morning gave a prayer request and they requested prayer for somebody in their family who was sick. I mean, there wasn't but two or three that didn't give that type of request. And it stirred our heart how many people today are hurting physically. Do we care? Does somebody really care? There are people today, Brother Mike, that they're hurting not just in their physical but in their emotional realm. They have been betrayed by maybe a spouse been betrayed by a co-worker, by a friend. They have been let down. They have been disappointed. They have been stomped on. They have been tromped on. They have been kicked out, kicked down, kicked around to the place to where they feel like they are laying in the gutter. And no one cares. I have no man. That's what the man said. There are those today in the church as outside the four walls of the church that are crushed in their spirit. The spiritual man is hurting. Maybe something happened in the church and, 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 I, and I will tell you something. Things are going to happen. Feelings are going to get hurt. Misunderstandings are going to take place. And it's the devil's business to blow things out of proportion. It's the devil's business to magnify things and get a hold of a little nugget and make a mountain out of it if we're not careful. And the only one that walks away hurting is us. Many good people have left the church over a lie of Satan. 
in a misunderstanding. Many good people have left the church because maybe of a lack of proper teaching. And there were some things in their mind because they were never taught correctly the Word of God. And when life happens and things come and things didn't work out the way they thought they should because while I was taught, Sister Katie, whenever I got saved, all my problems are going to go away. And it doesn't happen that way. One day life comes knocking at their door and there's a problem there. Well, I thought if I was born again, I didn't have any problems. And when problems come knocking, they think God has forsaken them. They think God has forgotten them. And they get discouraged and they give up. And then no one cares enough to try to do what the Word says do, and restore them. See, in the Samaritan, we see the church. Here was a man that represents who? You and I. He was a certain man. If he would have been Peter, his name would have been Peter. If it would have been Zechariah, his name would have been Zechariah. But he said a certain man. That certain man, we could insert our name in there. And we could be the one. And we may feel like tonight we are the one laying in the ditch somewhere, forsaken and forgotten, groaning, crying out in pain. You know when a person's hurting, that's what they do is they groan. You can't help it. When you're hurting, you're going to groan. And there are folk tonight that are groaning because they're hurting. What does the scripture say? Here comes the priest. Hold on, Brother Mike. Here comes us preachers. And we've got our agendas and we've got our meetings and we've got our schedules and we've got this and we've got that and we've got to we're too important to be bothered with that fine detail and I'm not picking on this man when I say this but I'm saying this is something that's taking place in the church of Jesus Christ in America today from the very top of the ranks of the denominational world throughout every church around this nation pastors have become preoccupied pastors have become too busy they they they, they some have feel like they're too important to get their hands dirty and they walk by and the word of God said this priest saw this man he recognized him he heard his groaning he heard his cry but he just didn't take the time to do what God would have had him to do you know what they tell us preachers all the time God don't care how much you know until he knows how much you care. We get so hung up on, like Brother Mike's statement, I love that. We get so hung up on the high Hebrew and the deep Greek that sometimes we forget the ABCs of the Word of God. The simple things of the Word of God. Oh, I've got to go preach this camp meeting for Brother Mike. He's going to come preach my camp meeting for me. I'm going to give him a $1,000 honorarium when he comes preach my camp meeting. He'll give me a $1,000 honorarium when I preach this. We'll pat one another on the back and we'll play politics in the church. Praise God and bless his holy name. And this kind of nonsense takes place. And there are men and women lying in the ditch, groaning, grieving, crying in their spirit. Now I'm off us preachers, you can relax. Because here come the Levite. Who the Levite? That's the fine upstanding church member. How many knows we're the, we're the priesthood today? We're the Levitical priesthood today. Here comes the church. And what the pastor did, what did the church do? Exactly the same thing. What the, what the, what the pastor did, 
The church followed suit. They come by, they looked, they saw, they heard, they turned their back, and they kept right on going. Why, that's not my job, it's Jonathan's job. He's the one that's the nurse. Let him take care of him. Well, what if Jonathan ain't coming by? Well, somebody go call Jonathan. Let him come by. Let him do it. And, 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 and this goes all over me, what I'm fixing to say. I've not been trained to do that. I've not been trained to do that. You know what training we've been given? The training of the Holy Ghost. I remember Peter and John going to the temple one day. And there was a man sitting outside the gate that because of his condition was not allowed inside the temple. He couldn't go in there because he was a cripple and cripples weren't allowed in there. He made his living sitting outside the gate begging crumbs and begging handouts and living off of charity. And he's asking alms of Peter and John. They looked down to him and they hadn't been trained. No one taught them anything. They didn't have a class in a back room somewhere. My friend, let me tell you, they were full of the Holy Ghost and they reached down and they took him by the hand and said, silver and gold. Have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And they lifted him to his feet. I want to tell you something. Education is great. And education is wonderful. And education is needed. But sometimes, oh, my friend, we use education as a crutch when we need to be full of the Holy Ghost like Peter and John. Jesus asked the question. Which of these men show, no, no, I forgot. Hold on, let me back up. Left out one of the most important parts. Here come a Samaritan. An unsaved, unholy, unsanctified, Sinner in the eyes of the Jewish people. I mean, this man had no God in him, according to them. But what did this man do? This man came by, had compassion on him. He heard his groans. Oh, he heard his cry. He had compassion. He, he, he was a busy man, but he stopped what he was doing to take care of this man's needs. Can I tell you something? Around the United States of America every year, there is probably millions of dollars spent on church growth conferences trying to tell you how to grow a church and how to have 100 by next Sunday morning or how to have 200 by next Sunday, Wednesday night or 300 by the end of the month. My friend, let me tell you, we'll throw all that garbage away and get back to the basics of the Word of God and get back to doing what the Word of God said do. See, there's a lot of garbage going on in the church world today that we've not been called to do. We've not been called to some of these conferences, Brother Mike. We've not been called to do some of the stuff that's going on. But what we've been called to do is have mercy, have love, have compassion. We've been called to make disciples. Go ye therefore unto all nations and teach them them whatsoever you observe, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always. Now, I want to tell you something. I got a little college degree and got a little certificate behind my name and all that, and that's fine. That's wonderful. But it doesn't take somebody with a PhD to look at the book of Acts and begin to read whenever these men and women were full of the Holy Ghost, and they began to do what the Word of God said do, and they began to go door to door and house to house with breaking and bread and prayer. My friend, the church grew daily. People were healed. People were delivered. People were set free. And the church grew. And 
those that have turned the world have upside down have come hither also, was said of them. Jesus asked a question to his disciples. He said, of these three people, the preacher, the church member, and the sinner, which one was a friend to this man lying in the ditch? Which of these, thinkest thou, was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Some of you scholars, tell me what the next verse says. Go ahead and roll it over. He that showed me. Now, 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 let's not stop there. What does the last three words, four or five words say? Go and do thou likewise. That's not a suggestion, folks. That's a commandment. That's not a novel idea or a novel concept. That's thus saith the Lord. We got folk around us right now. Oh, they're hurting. They're crushed. They're devastated. We see them in Walmart. Whoop, that's brother so-and-so. I'm going to go down another aisle because I just don't have time to bother with him right now and his problems. My friend, let me tell you something. That's exactly what God has called us to do is to lift up his burden and help him carry his burden. My friend, now the Bible tells us we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of them that are weak. We have become so preoccupied with our own lives and our own situations and our own needs and our own wants and our own hurts and our own hang-ups that if we would get to the basics of the Word and concentrate more on reaching out to others, God would send somebody to reach back to us. Hear me. I believe that, Brother Mike. If we would somehow see the things that you're going through as a distraction of the devil, the hurt and the torment and the pain is real. And I'm not trying to minimize that one bit because it's real, but it's a distraction of the devil to keep you from doing what the Lord Jesus Christ has the church has commissioned us to do. But somehow we've got to shake it off. Somehow we've got to put it aside. You know, one of the greatest struggles I've had in ministry, and I've had my share of problems in life. I'm, not going to, I'm like everybody else. And I'm sure this man faces the same thing. It comes to that place in the day, okay, in my busy week where I've got to start getting ready for Sunday morning. And that means I've got to put my problems aside. I've got to put Ricky on a shelf and forget about me and get in touch with God and get in tune with God for you. And if I learn to leave that stuff on the shelf rather than go back Sunday night and try to pick it up again, I'd been better off most of the time. Go to Isaiah 61, please. God has given us the Holy Ghost. He said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you to do what? To be a witness unto me in Jerusalem, unto Jerusalem, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. He hasn't given us the Holy Ghost just to make us feel good. I love to shout, folks. You know that. I love to dance in the Spirit. I love to sing in the Spirit. I love to be on the spout when the glory is coming out. I love it. It's part of who I am. It's in my, my DNA. But there's more to it than just that. Isaiah said the Spirit of the Lord is upon who? Somebody read that and tell me what it says. Who is me? Who is me? Who is me? Who's the Spirit of the Lord on? Me. 
Why? Because the Lord has anointed who? Me. To preach good tidings unto the meek. I have good news to bring, and that is why I sing. Oh, my Lord Jesus, I've got a good news message in a bad news world. Jesus Christ is alive and well. I've got a message of healing. I've got a message of deliverance. I've got a message of sanctification. I've got a message of hope. I've got a message of help. I've got the good news message. And it begins with J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. And he has given me the Holy Ghost. He has given you the Holy Ghost. He has anointed us. To do what? Keep silent. To let it out. To let it out. I know none of you would do this, but I've heard of people, boy, when they hear about some good juicy gossip, they can't wait to get on the phone and call somebody and tell them about it. I've heard about people like that. I don't know any of them, but I've heard of people like that. What would happen if we were here Something good about Jesus. And oh, my Lord, can't wait to get on the phone. Can't wait to get on Facebook. Can't wait to get on some this or some that. Can't wait to, 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 to spread the good news of what Jesus Christ is doing. Hey, we had somebody saved last Sunday night. Hey, we had somebody healed last Wednesday night. Hey, I talked to somebody in the supermarket last week, and I laid hands on them, and I prayed for them, and God delivered them. He has anointed me. Go to the next one. He has sent who? Me. To do what? Bind up the brokenhearted. Friend, let me tell you something. There are some brokenhearted folks out there. And we need to quit being selfish. You got to love me to make it to heaven. We be selfish. Now, if that was us, we'd want somebody to pray for us. If that was us, we'd want, with my Lord, we'd want Brother Mike to get on his little phone and send out that little mass text message that he sends out to everybody and put my name at the top of the list. I need prayer. How many people stop and pray when you get those things? Hello? There's a broken-hearted world out there that needs Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a broken-hearted church that needs Jesus Christ. You have brothers and sisters that walk through these doors week in and week out without fail that they're battling life with everything they've got in them. You might have never walked there. You may have never experienced what they have experienced, but some have, and you know what I'm talking about. And when you feel like Job, and you feel like sitting on the ash heap and everything that is near and dear and precious to you is taken away, and you don't understand why, but all you know is God is still on the throne, and that's all I need to know. But you have brothers and sisters that walk in, and some may have walked in this place tonight, that they're crushed, and they're devastated, and they're heartbroken. What do they need? They need to know somebody cares. They need to know there's a man, brother. They need to know there's a woman, sister, that will come, take them by the hand, and say, here, the waters are troubled at the altar. The Holy Ghost is stirring at the altar. Let's go to the altar and pray about it. Bind up the brokenhearted. Proclaim liberty to the captives and open the prison to them that are bound. Whose responsibility is this? It's ours. Whose place is this? It's ours. But what do we do? Sometimes 
Well, let's leave it up to somebody else. That's Brother Mike's job. That's why he gets all the big bucks. That's why, you know, he lives in that beautiful house and drives all them fancy cars and has all the perks of being the pastor of the church. Let him do it. When he told you he was up at 3 o'clock in the morning, he didn't lie. He was up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I want to tell you something. You carry that man's responsibility, and I know for a fact because I, I still have it happen to me. You get those nights where you can't sleep. You get those nights where right in the middle of the night when it would be wonderful, Brother David Hull, to lay down and just sleep till 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, you talk about coming to church. Sometimes a pastor just likes to be able to sleep. But the Holy Ghost has other plans. Come on, boy. I need to talk to you. Now, I'm going to do something right now that I've never done in all my years of ministry in an altar service. I want every head bowed, every eye closed, and no one moving. Musicians, just stay where you're at. I want you to be a part of this as well. We are at a very sobering, very, so, very sobering time right now. You may have come to this place with hurts. It may be a physical hurt. Maybe a backache. It could be whatever physical ailment that you may be coming with. But you're hurting. And Brother Rick, I don't talk about it a whole lot because people just get tired of hearing me complain and, I, and so I just bear the pain in silence. You don't have to bear it alone. It may be that you're wounded in your spirit. Something has happened in your spiritual journey that has brought pain into your spirit world. And it has hindered your anointing. It has hindered your closeness with the Lord. It has had a devastating effect on your spiritual walk. You just don't walk where you one time walked. I don't talk about it. Nobody cares to hear about it. Or maybe you're like me. I'm just too private. I'm just too, too closed to let people in. Because I've been hurt when I've opened up to people and tried to share my heart with people. And I've been hurt. So I don't open up and I don't share. I just internalize and hold it in. Maybe you come tonight and you felt the sting of betrayal. Maybe a spouse. Maybe a family member. Maybe a co-worker. But somebody's hurt you. Someone has said something about you that was not true and it's devastated you. It's crushed your spirit. Someone has done something against you and it's broken you and you carry those scars and yes, you have forgiven them as the word has told you. You've taken it to the altar but you can't seem to forget and it's a nagging torment that you can't shake free from. I don't care whether it's in your body. I don't care whether it's in your spirit. I don't care whether it's in your mind. If you have a hurt tonight and you've been carrying this hurt and you're ready to get rid of it, tonight these altars are the pool of Bethesda and the Holy Ghost is troubling the waters. The Holy Ghost is here to stir the waters. And if you're one of those that say, Brother Rick, Every head's bowed. No one's looking around. I've got a hurt that I need a healing from. I've got a hurt that I need deliverance from. I need to be set free. But no one cares. 
I feel like no one cares about my hurt. I want you to raise your hand right now. I want you to raise your hand if that's you. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be. God, the Holy Ghost wants to do something in this place tonight. The Holy Ghost wants to do something in this place tonight. There's hands that are raised. There need to be some others that are raised. Be honest with the Holy Ghost right now. I've been hurt, and I've carried this too long, and I want to be set free. Now, what I'm about to do isn't for everybody, but there are a few of you right now that keep those hands up. Keep those hands up. Keep those hands up. Because there's a few right now that the Holy Ghost is tugging at your heart, and he's telling you to go to that person. Take them by the hand. Lead them to the pool of Bethesda and let them know you care. Let them know that you care about their hurt. Let, hey, you don't have to get personal with them. You don't have to get into their innermost deep, dark secrets. But just let them know I'm here. I'm praying with you. I love you. While you keep your hands raised, while you keep your hands raised, there are some of you that the Holy Ghost is touching your heart right now. Get up from your seat. Get up from where you're at. Go to those people. Go to those places. Go to these. Take them by the hand. Lift them up. Lead them to the pool of Bethesda. And let them be healed from these things in their life. Right now. Right now. All across this place. If you haven't raised your hand but you want to, it's not too late. If you haven't raised your hand but you want to, it's not too late. You say, well, Brother Rick, I, I, I really don't want to do that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The waters are troubled. The Holy Ghost is moving. The Holy Ghost is stirring right now. Come, let's find a place. Right now, come. Let's find a place. Let's find some place where we can give our burden to the Lord, where we can get healing, where we can get deliverance, where we can get what we need.